Welcome to Living Hope. In today's message, Stir Up Your Gift, Dr. McLuhan shares an encouraging message on the 77th anniversary of Ingleside Church. Today we celebrate the 77th anniversary of the establishment of our church. In 1943, a missionary lady by the name of Louise Fletcher started a home meeting not very far from where we are seated right now. That meeting turned into a Sunday school, and the Sunday school became Broad Creek Baptist Church. In 1947, Broad Creek Baptist Church launched a new mission called Nelson Park Baptist Mission to reach another part of our city. And that was our original name, Nelson Park Baptist Mission. Eventually, that mission moved into the elementary school just nearby us, and in 1955, the church bought the property where we are currently seated. The name of the church was changed from Nelson Park to Ingleside Baptist Church to, um, to match the name of our community, and from that beginning, we have begun to grow. How could Miss Fletcher have ever imagined that the home group she started all those years ago would bear so much fruit for the kingdom of God? She set in motion a movement that has sent members from this church to over 100 nations around the world. She laid the foundation for a Christian school that has served over 7,000 students. She launched a media ministry she didn't know would exist that is causing us to broadcast the gospel in 185 nations. She opened the door for more than 11 million people to hear the message of salvation through Jesus Christ. Miss Louise is a modern-day Lois, the mother of Eunice, and the grandmother of Timothy, who became the Apostle Paul's son in the ministry. She is a modern-day Lewis. So we give thanks to God for her. We celebrate today. It's good to remember the charge that Paul gave to Timothy when he became the pastor of the church in Ephesus. Paul said, I remind you of the sincere faith, a faith that first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. Paul went on to say, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Aren't you so glad? 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. It's always good to be reminded to stir up the gift of the Holy Spirit that's been placed in us. It's even better to be reminded to live in the power and in the love of the Lord upon our lives. So we renounce a spirit of fear that always tries to paralyze the next generation from believing that there's diminished hope for our future. So often you hear young people say, you guys have messed up the world, and now we have to inherit the world and live in a diminished world. It's just not true. There is a God who can open doors and overcome all obstacles. I break off any fear you feel about your future or the future of your children, and I break off any fear you may have about the future life of this church. Now, aging churches are often paralyzed when sometimes there's a perception of past glory days, especially when people say, I remember when, in the sentence that's about to follow, is an indication of past glory. There are certain days that I remember, but I'm looking forward more than ever to all that God has for us to do. I love the imagery that Paul used to encourage Timothy. It's translated in many different ways. Some people say rekindle. Some say kindle afresh. Some say keep using. Some say stir up. Some say keep ablaze. And some say fan into flames. Well, these are very visual things for us to think about today. I remember when we cooked on, uh, <laughs> cooked on a, a wood stove in Africa. Uh, I remember when we heated our home, even here in America, with wood. People who've done that know 
exactly what Paul meant. A fire can't be left unattended. It will quickly lose its power. It needs to be stoked. It needs to be stirred up to keep hot and ready for use. So God has not called us to coast. God has called us to run our race to the finish line. And I'm so proud of folks in this room who are running with all that they have for our church to become that God wants it to become. It's inappropriate for old members to say it's time for the younger ones to take up the tasks if they've not taken the time to personally mentor the replacement in ministry. I hope you're mentoring somebody who can take the reins from you and carry the church forward. It's a beautiful thing to see older persons grow deeper spiritually as their physical strength diminishes. Mother used to say to me, I just don't know why I'm here, but Joyce and I were clear that in her 90s, we knew why she was still here. We needed her prayers. We needed her love. And you have something to give all the way until your last breath. Today, I stir up all of us, from the youngest to the oldest, to run our race to the best of our ability until Jesus calls us home. Last week's message on the life of the Apostle John has had many comments. I've been quite surprised at the reception it's had. In fact, the biographies of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the writers of the gospel that we've recently studied, have all resonated with people. If you've not watched them, I encourage you to do so. It's easier to find these messages on my YouTube channel, Dr. Peter McLuhan, under the playlist, Exploring the Gospels. And people's confidence in the eyewitness accounts of the life of Jesus have grown stronger. One might ask, well, how do I stir up the gift that is in me? We do it by going back to the basics of reading and meditating on God's word, by praying and doing the things we did when we first trusted Jesus. You remember how you felt. Encourage you to make a fresh start, giving Jesus first place in your life, first place in your priorities. Give him to Jesus today and let him lift you again and put air under your wings and to minister in a powerful way. Well, on this anniversary Sunday, I'd like to take a second text of scripture to comment, and this is taken from Paul's letter that, uh, or the Apostle John's letter, excuse me, that he wrote to the church at Ephesus when he was on the island of Patmos. It's another appropriate warning received from an old man on this anniversary occasion. After commenting on the members of the Ephesians church and thanking them for the many good things that they had accomplished, he gave them this warning. And speaking on behalf of Jesus, he said, I have a, this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. And look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works that you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place amongst the churches. Revelation chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. What stern words these are. A rather strong admonition given to what many people believe to be the strongest church in Asia Minor. It's a good warning for us today. The loss of first love, that which turns delight into duty and takes the joy out of ministry. We want to revive that first love today. It's a symptom of losing the wonder of our salvation. It's an indication that our loving relationship with the Lord is growing stagnant and we are simply becoming religious. You can tell it in people's lives. You can almost smell it when you go into a church, a spirit of religiosity and routine and duty rather than delight and the freshness of the excitement of the presence of the Holy Spirit working in people's lives. It's the risk of believing that somehow we have arrived. Oh, that's a dangerous feeling. If any of those statements resonate with you in any kind of way, I call you back to the love that you felt when you first followed Jesus. Pastor Margaret loves to share the story of how after she received Jesus as her Savior at a youth retreat, the Methodist youth retreat some hours from here, 
Uh, her girlfriends commented on the glow on her face. They wanted to know what had gotten into you. What's gotten into you? Of course, it was Jesus who had gotten into her. She was manifesting first love for Jesus. And Jesus wants us to live in such a way that people want to know what's gotten into you. What's different about you? It's the presence of Holy Spirit bringing fresh vitality to our lives and to all that we do. So here are some signs that first love is returning to our congregation. I'm excited to share these things with you. Some you may know, some you may not know, but young people have been praying three nights a week for our church in this building, for our city, for the nation, for the world, for the countries they came from. And it's exciting every now and then to stop in and listen to the fervency of the prayer that's being offered in this room. This room is being stewarded by those who come and pray that the presence of God would be felt. It's so often when I bring visitors into this room, they say, I feel a presence here. And it's being stewarded by the vitality that we carry when we come into this room. Uh, uh, some of our young people are going out on the streets and sharing their faith with others. We've been listening to testimonies from time to time. Yesterday, young people fed homeless people uh, a meal in downtown Norfolk. They expected uh, 60 to come or prepared for 60, 70 showed. They ran out of food, and what a blessing that is, and worshiping and just singing on the streets and lifting up the name of the Lord. Isn't that great? That's a sign of first love and determination to reach. We give thanks to God. Last weekend, two young people were baptized up at Ocean View. I just love doing open-air baptisms, and people inevitably will come by and say, are you doing a baptism? And they say, oh, I remember, or I remember when I used to go to church. In fact, someone talked with Pastor Margaret about that. And it just stirs people up, and those of us who who watched had joy. Fifteen of us, I think, were there for this happy occasion. Those uh, young people had waited seven years for the opportunity to be in a place where they could be free to be baptized. On Friday night, five of our members took uh, food and seven gift baskets uh, donated by our Benevolence Fund uh, to welcome new students arriving at Old Dominion University. What a joy it was to meet with some people. I sat next to a young man from Nepal. He was so surprised that I had visited his country. Others from India and talked about, well, where did you go? And I I mentioned the places I've been. He said, well, you've been all over India. (laughs) And indeed I have. Um, What a joy to share with people, to realize uh, afresh the joy of reaching out into people's lives. Pastor Margaret, in this very room, is teaching an Alpha course at Homeschool Plus to some of the students that have questions about their faith. And young people are are in a free environment to ask any question they want to ask. And this Alpha course has a way of providing answers in a non-threatening kind of way, in an open environment. One of the students this week, for the first time, actually participated And she just felt the Spirit of God moving in these students' lives. We think there's more coming with Alpha. It's a great course. If you'd like to have a home group, Alpha would be a good way to invite neighbors and to share the message of Jesus with people who have questions about it all. Uh, Regular power surge has been renewed. I think we're coming up on number four this coming uh, Friday, four in a row. Uh, We had power surge monthly for a long time, and COVID changed some of that. So we're so glad that there's an emphasis upon power. Uh, The particular emphasis upon power surge is to have extended worship and then to have extended teaching and extended times of prayer and prophecy. Our benevolence team has been more active helping people in the last two months. How exciting is that? We've helped people from the Middle East uh, to these international students and then with some local needs as well. Uh, Yesterday in this very room, Pastor Margaret led a seminar on how to love your children. It's a book uh, by Campbell that uh, has helped us raise our children. And there was just a hunger in the room for people to hear about that. She left with the feeling in her spirit, I'm going to do this again. Has no idea when or how, but the people who attended will invite her because the word spread about how much they received. 
Recently, Pastor Margaret and I were invited to speak on the Holy Spirit with a particular emphasis to a Bible study group in Washington, D.C. I was introduced by saying, this is the first time we've ever had clear teaching on the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine? And so what a joy to be able to share out of our experience, the experience that we've had here at Ingleside, the things that we've learned. We were able to share with them how God is moving today in healing, not just around the world, but right here locally in America. This church believed in healing before I ever came, but not many people were healed in that in their prayers, and there's a reason for that. Many churches pray for healing, especially they pray on Wednesday night for healing for people who are not present. But healing changes when we learn to use the language that Jesus used. Pastor Margaret and I attended some seminars to sharpen our language when we pray for people's um, physical needs, and we've learned to use the power and authority that Jesus delegated to all of his followers, uh, to pray with authority and to tell diseases to go. And what a joy. I shared with that group. Somebody called uh, this morning or last week and said, uh, said, would you pray for me? And so we've been praying for a young man uh, who has, uh, has a cancer, a third, fourth stage pancreatic cancer. We've been continually praying for him this past week. Others uh, called and said, could you take some time just to talk to us further about the subject. So we've had influencing people to move in the power of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes you hear in the American church, well, that's for overseas. They don't have doctors. But they simply are hungry for a touch from God. Listen, overseas, there aren't doctors. What are you talking about? It's 50 miles to the nearest hospital, 50 miles to the nearest clinic, 100 miles to the nearest hospital. You have to have faith. Or it's faith in God or it's faith in the witch doctor. And so we're so glad that healing is available. There's as much unbelief in America as there is in Africa, (laughs) more belief in Africa than there is in America. So we need healing right here. And as we move in it, God wants to move through us, and so we're so glad for what is happening. There's nothing like the flow of the Holy Spirit through your hands healing somebody to restore first love. I don't think I've ever prayed for somebody got healed. I didn't laugh. It's just like, overwhelm me, who, me, you used me, <laughs> really, God? <laughs> and the joy that wells up within us, it's the joy of first love. God wants to use you. He wants healing to flow through your hands. So all of these things I've shared are signs of reemerging joy and love in serving the Lord. So if you're feeling the loss of first love for Jesus or the church, We invite you to take a step this week towards doing the things that you did when you first met Jesus, and he is waiting for you to reach out to him and take your next step. There's one more scripture that I would like to share with you today. In preparing for an anniversary Sunday, I like to look at the psalm that matches the anniversary number that we are celebrating So, of course, this is 77, you're 77. So this week I've been looking at Psalm 77, and I found some related verses or things that I feel like relate to us as a church. Uh, Consider this cry from Asaph, one of the major contributors to the book of Psalms. Turn with me to Psalm 99, the opening cry. I cry out to God. Yes, I shout. Oh, that God would listen to me. When I was in deep trouble, I searched for the Lord. All night long I prayed with hands lifted towards heaven, but my soul was not comforted. I wonder if you've ever felt that way. You just can't get through to heaven for one reason or another. That's how Asaph felt. If you've ever felt that way, then you understand the cry of this man's heart. Uh, So with all the good news that I have shared with you, you might be wondering Uh, Why is there a need to cry out to the Lord? What is there a need to cry out to the Lord about? So as your senior pastor, I need to sound an alarm that there's been a shift in giving in the church and the support of our school that we need to know about. At the beginning of July, our giving was over $3,000 ahead of our giving last year. But by the end of September, I'm talking about last week, our giving was $1,500 behind last year. 
And this means that our giving over the last six weeks has dropped $4,500 in eight weeks. That's a, that's a huge drop in giving. The school is facing an even greater loss of income, and so we're struggling right now. I want to be clear that the media ministry takes absolutely no resources from the church. All of that is given by outside people who support our funding. It is our own need and our own lack of provision that we are facing right now. And so our stewardship team is asking you to join them in crying out to the Lord for his provision for us and for our future. Uh, we have reached a financial red line. In sharing this news with you, we are asking you to stand with us against the spirit of fear. We are asking you to believe that God has a provision for us. The psalmist goes on to say these words, O oh God, your ways are holy. Is there any God mighty like you? You are a God of great wonders. You demonstrate your awesome power amongst the nations. Your strong arm, you redeemed your people. Psalm 93, verse 13 and 15. Uh, I'm so glad we serve a great God, a God of wonders who demonstrates awesome power amongst the nations. So last night, Deacon Farabee and I cried out to the Lord for the financial needs of our church and of our school. What a joy to pray together, to pray in the spirit, to pray with faith, to pray with earnesty, and to ask God to do something for us. We didn't pray in fear. We declared with the psalmist, by your strong arm, you redeemed your people we're asking God to redeem us from the need that we have. And we hope this message encourages not only the members of our own congregation, but the members uh, in our partnership, in our network of partners. We now have over 12,000 pastors and ministers leading more than 8,000 churches, ministries around the world. Many write to us asking for financial assistance. We always are clear we're not able to do that. But most people in churches overseas think that all American churches are rich. Do you believe that? <laughs> it's amazing how people believe that. But we want you, our partners, to know that like you, we live by faith, looking to the Lord every week to meet our financial needs. We have found him faithful, and that we know that you will find him faithful. There are just some things that money can't buy. Have you figured that out already? Money can't buy peace, can't buy health, can't buy safety from the troubles of this world. And so there are just some things that money can't do. I'm not saying I wouldn't like to have more, and I'm sure everybody in this room would like to have more. They asked Rockefeller, how much more? Just a little bit, he said. <laughs> but there's some things that are free. It's the presence of God in your life. Asaph concluded with the psalm, with these encouraging words, it was through you, it was your way was through the sea, your path was through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. Isn't that interesting? You led your people like a flock. Now, sometimes God leads us to the waters that are over our head, just like he did in the wilderness and that point is actually the point of our salvation. Sometimes we can't see the footprints of God on the path that he has placed for us to follow, but he is always near. If you're facing an impossible situation, we invite you to turn to Jesus for salvation today. Ask him to save you like he saved the people of old. Jesus came to help us overcome the challenges that we face in life. He came to help us find meaning and purpose. I believe the Lord is drawing to him, people to himself, who are facing what feels like an impossible situation. I'm sure that's resonating with some in the room. This is impossible. It may be financial, medical crisis. Jesus has a solution for everyone. Ask Jesus to lift the uncertainty of where you will spend eternity from your shoulders. Jesus came to make it possible for us to have a close relationship with God, to know that we will go to heaven when we die. Ask him to fill you with the presence of his Holy Spirit 
Say with me, thank you, Jesus, for dying for me on the cross to pay for my sins and inviting me to live in a close relationship with you. If you just prayed with me to accept Jesus as your Savior or were healed while listening to this message, write to me and I will share more information with you about what it means to follow Jesus. Father, thank you for your faithfulness to this congregation for 77 years. We give you glory. We rededicate ourselves to you that your purposes will be worked out in this gathering. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope this message has filled you with living hope in Jesus. If you would like to talk to someone about your spiritual journey, please leave a comment or send us a private message. We enjoy reading your notes and having an opportunity to pray with you. If you received a blessing through this message, please share it with others. We invite you to become a Living Hope Partner by donating as little as a dollar a month through our QR code. Your gifts will help us create new messages and reach more people. Living Hope is a ministry of Ingleside International Incorporated. All donations for Living Hope qualify as a charitable contribution. Thank you for your prayers and support. Next week, we will continue learning together from the Word of God. God bless you and fill you with living hope.